good. Good, good, good. As it's uh it is hot in here apparently. Yeah. Eighty Fahrenheit. Twenty six point six apparently Celsius. All right. Um, today, uh, study title is Lessons from the Destruction of Sodom. So if you guys have any prayer requests, you can put them into the room. And we will begin shortly. Okay. All right. Let's begin. If you can, please kneel so that we can pray. And please, by hearts. Heavenly Father, thank you for this holy Sabbath day. Please bless us in your word. Please allow your Holy Spirit to write on my tongue and any other tongue that speaks on your behalf. And please allow your truth to be made known and for it to strengthen us and guide us and teach us and guide us. And we thank you for all the lessons that are contained in your word. How we can learn the same thing or similar things from multiple different areas. And see things that we may have not seen before. Thank you for loving us and giving us all the means and ways that you've granted us to be able to be saved. Whether it's through, of course, the death of your, well, with, including the death of your son and all the other ways that you help us. We lift up the prayers that are in the room and all that are minds and hearts of your people. With the help of your Holy Spirit that we pray for these things. And in Jesus' mighty and precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. All right. All right. Let's begin. Destruction of Sodom. We're going to start today with Luke chapter 17, verses 28 to 33, which says, Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day... He which shall be upon the housetop, and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not turn, return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. Christ demonstrated that his coming, the second coming, will be likened unto the destruction that we see here at Sodom. 
And the scene of the inhabitants of Sodom is one of where the individuals are eating, they're drinking, they're buying things, they're planting things, they're building houses. And as you read those things, the reader takes note that there's actually no particular sin in these things, right? There's no particular sin in eating food and drinking, you know, things, obviously things that are good for you. Um, and going out and planting things like planting vineyards. There's no sin in building a house. But these things are brought forward here to help demonstrate the fact that with these things, these people are living a life that when the destruction comes, they're completely going to be unaware of it. To them, there is no appearance that destruction is about to happen. All things are viewed and seen as peaceful for them. Even with the inhabitants of Sodom, there is no, there is no appearance of want. For example, Genesis chapter 13 verse 10 tells us, And Lot lifted up his eyes, and behold, all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. So let's get a quote now from Patriarchs and Prophets. Let's see what this says. On page 156, paragraph 1. It says, Fairest among the cities of the Jordan Valley was Sodom, set in a plain which was as the garden of the Lord in its fertility and beauty. Here, the luxuriant vegetation of the tropics flourished. Here was the home of the palm tree, the olive, and the vine. And flowers shed their fragrance throughout the year. Rich harvests clothed the fields, and flocks and herds covered the encircling hills. Art and commerce contributed to enrich the proud city of the plain. The treasures of the east adorned her palaces. And the caravans of the desert brought their stores of precious things to supply her marks of trade. With little thought or labor, every want of life could be supplied. And the whole year seemed one round of festivity. Sodom is viewed as a rather luxuriant place. The outward scenery again gives no apparent view of its impending doom. It was rich in vegetation, commerce, and art. Yet Sister White touches upon the fact that the inhabitants of Sodom had little thought or labor, and that the whole year seemed one round of festivity. It is because of this that you see what you see in Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 48 to 49, which says, As I live, saith the Lord, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And so Sodom here, God is likening Israel unto Sodom as her sister. And God is pointing out here that Sodom was filled with iniquity. She was filled with pride, fullness of bread, and she was idle. And of course, when an individual is idle, of course, Satan can take control of things that are going on in their lives because they are so idle. That's the necessity of us learning to become busy with our hands. Right? So, this also, this point here also seems to lay a foundation for an understanding of something that we see about Babylon. For example, in Revelation chapter 18, verses 11 to 13, it says, And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet, and all thion wood, and all manner of vessels of ivory, and all manner of vessels of most precious wood, and of brass, and iron, and marble, 
and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. And so we see abundance that was in Sodom, but we also can see a parallel, a bit of a parallel in Revelation with Babylon and that she is filled with all of these things, all of these precious goods. So Sodom was graced with many temporal advantages of which they took, but they became corrupt through those taking advantage of those temporal advantages. But though we see that they had temporal advantages, the question is, did Sodom have any spiritual advantages? Were they just a land that just went off to become wicked with no light from the Lord whatsoever? Were they just a wicked people going from wickedness to wickedness, not having any rays of divine light to shine upon them so that they could see their errors? On page 157, paragraph 2, in Patriarch's Prophets. It says, at the time of Lot's removal to Sodom, corruption had not become universal, and God, in his mercy, permitted rays of light to shine amid the moral darkness. When Abraham rescued the captives from the Elamites, the attention of the people was called to the true faith. Abraham was not a stranger to the people of Sodom, and his worship of the unseen God had been a matter of ridicule among them. But... His victory over greater, over greatly superior forces and his sorry, magnanimous disposition of the prisoners and spoil excited wonder and admiration. While his skill and valor were extolled, none could avoid the conviction that a divine power had made him conqueror and his noble and unselfish spirit so foreign to the self-seeking inhabitants of Sodom, was another evidence of the superiority of the religion which he had honored by his courage and fidelity. Agnemonious means generous or forgiving, especially toward a rival or less powerful person. Uh. <laughs> so the attention of the people of Sodom were blessed in the sense that they were called to the true to view the true faith. They were permitted to come under the control of other kings, and Abraham had saved them. They were convicted of the truth that a divine power had made Abraham conqueror. So even though they're making his religion a matter of ridicule, they were allowed to see that. His, he had a divine power which attended his efforts. Now, this conviction, of course, had to come to them, and it would have to rest, they would have to wrestle with that in comparison to their own idols, in comparison to their own deities. Why did not their idols and the gods that they worshipped save them? Why was it a superior, why was it an individual that they wouldn't have trusted who would be viewed as superior religion to them is that which saved them. Now, of course, that's on the side of Abraham. People of Sodom also had one living in their midst, Lot, who would have been as a light dwelling amidst that darkness. So the people of Sodom were not without light. They had great and many temporal advantages, but God permitted in his mercy the religion of Abraham 
and of Lot to shine not only upon Sodom, but also one dwelt in Sodom. Yet the convictions and the light shone upon these people were resisted. Their doom was soon to follow. Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 to 21, it says, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. Now Abraham, being a righteous man, was permitted to know that the Lord had intended to go to Sodom and had intended to destroy it. Yet, Righteous Abraham pleaded for the city not to be destroyed. And beginning at the number 50, Abraham pleads that God would spare the city if he found within it merely 10 righteous individuals. It says in Genesis chapter 18, verse 32. And he said, O let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but, yet but this once. Peradventure, 10 shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. What's very interesting about this is that it's, they make Abraham a subject of ridicule. But what did Abraham do? He saved them through the power which God gave him to save the, the inhabitants of Sodom. And so light was permitted to shine upon them, even though they mocked, they had made his religion a subject of ridicule. And it was also Abraham that was pleading for them that they would be spared if God could find ten righteous individuals. And so they were nearly spared again by the same individual. Now isn't that interesting? Because this brings to mind the way that the wicked can sometimes behave. They look down, they mock, and they make fun of the Christians that surround them, the true individuals that surround them. But... The true Christians and the true individuals that are the true Christians in heart that are surrounding them are busy praying for their good, praying that their eyes are opened. And so they might mock you, they might make fun of you. But take the lesson that we learn here from Abraham. Let's continue to pray for them. Let's continue to desire for them to have their eyes opened that they may see. Because it may very well be that destruction is coming upon them. And they do not yet know it. So in Genesis chapter 19, verses 1 to 3, it says, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house. And tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly. And they turned in unto him, and entered into his house. And he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. Now on page 158, paragraph 1. Patriarchs of Prophecy says, In the twilight, two strangers drew near to the city gate. They were apparently travelers coming in to tarry for the night. None could discern in these humble wayfarers the mighty heralds of divine judgment. And little dreamed the gay, careless multitude that in their treatment of these heavenly messengers, that very night they would reach the climax of the guilt which doomed their proud city. But there was one man who manifested kindly attention toward the strangers and invited them to his home. Lot did not know their true character, but politeness and hospitality were habitual with him. They were part of his religion. Lessons that he had learned from the example of Abraham. Had he not cultivated a spirit of courtesy, he might have been left to perish with the rest of Sodom. Many a household, in closing its doors against a stranger, has shut out God's messenger, who would have brought 
blessing and hope and peace. Isn't it interesting saying the simple act of courtesy brought into the home of Lot, the messengers of mercy. This is a lesson that we've learned in ter terms of that which has also happened in other parts of the scriptures. For example, in the case of Elijah with the widow woman, in the case of Elisha with the Shunammite woman. True Christ-likeness brings a blessing to the believers themselves, those they dwell with, and those who manifest mercy to them. It is true. It is a true saying, as the scriptures say, you reap what you sow. This is something that people have to understand, that every act, no matter how small or large it is, positive or negative, has some kind of bearing upon our lives. What we see here from Lot is that Lot had a spirit of hospitality. And even with the when the angels had essentially said, nah, we're just going to dwell out here tonight, he pressed upon them greatly. Lot knew the character of the inhabitants of Sodom. So he knew that he had to press a sword upon them to try to help them. Because if he did not do this thing, if he did not do these do this thing, he would not be blessed. Sorry. Well, it's true that he would not be blessed, but that they would not be protected from what was going to happen. So nineteen verses four to nine. But before they laid down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them, and shut the door after him, and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and ye do and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. So we see in comparison, Lot had a spirit of courtesy. Lot was a courteous individual, but he could see and he knew the inhabitants of Sodom were not like that. The inhabitants of Sodom were bent upon obeying the promptings of their flesh. Now, it has to be understood that this action by the men of Sodom had become the norm. Mercy and the love of man had departed from the hearts of these wicked individuals. They behaved more like wild beasts, depraved animals, rather than like men. And even Sister White says on page 159, paragraph 2, she says, That last night was marked by no greater sins than many others before it. But mercy, so long slighted, had at last ceased its pleadings. The inhabitants of Sodom had passed the limits of divine forbearance, the hidden boundary between God's patience and his wrath. The fires of his vengeance were about to be kindled in the veil of of Siddim. So it was the norm for Sodom to behave the way that they were behaving. This wasn't one singular instance of extreme wickedness, but that they had cultivated and genuinely gotten to this point that they behaved in this manner. Now the inhabitants of Sodom, at the pleading of Lot, felt rebuked. 
because though he called them brethren, brethren in an effort to win their hearts, they reviled him for his statements, right? They knew that he had come from another land. They marked his conduct. And then they said, he will needs be a judge. Now, what's interesting about this statement is it's a similar statement that is found in the mouths of those who despise Christians rebuking their sins. Though a Christian may rebuke their sins with the kindest and tenderest pity and with the utmost sympathy, these individuals will become very agitated. They will become very irritated. And the response will be back, you're judging us. You're judging me. It's interesting because it's as Christ said it would be, as it was in the days of Lot. So it will be in the day when Christ comes. So their wrath is going to be kindled against one who dares to try to awaken them from their carnal security. The spiritual slumber that the inhabitants of Sodom had felt or had lived under, they desired not to be awakened from. Now in verses 10 to 14 of chapter 19, it says, But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides? Son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And when he's talking about mocked here, it means to laugh outright in merriment or scorn by implication to sport. So they just think he's making sport. They just think that he's just mocking them. They're not taking what he's saying seriously. Now, these sons-in-laws were the ones who had married Lot's first two daughters. And the warning that is carried to them is that they must escape from the city because God is about to destroy that city. But they view his warnings as a mere mockery. And thus, because these individuals, because these two sons-in-laws had been married to Lot's daughters, two of Lot's daughters, it sealed the fate of two of the daughters of Lot. And it shows us here that the selection of Sodom as a place for Lot had brought his daughters into a position which could lead to their destruction. These two individuals had been given in marriage. And this marriage that they were given into was to their destruction. The message of mercy rejected by Lot sealed the doom of the sons-in-laws and of the daughters. And they lost the privilege that God had hoped to give them. And so it shows us how, when it comes to individuals, even when it comes to selecting a place to live, why, when it comes to living in the places such as the cities, it becomes so dangerous. Because although Lot may have been the strongest of the family, his own two daughters were not. And they had married the inhabitants of Sodom. And because they had done so, they were to be destroyed with Sodom. Now in Genesis chapter 19, verse 15 and 16, it says, And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. 
And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. Now, Lot here, his wife and his two daughters, which are here, refers to the fact that Lot had other daughters who had not yet been married off. That's why Lot, when speaking to the inhabitants of Sodom, said he had two daughters who had not yet known him. Right? So there were two that were still living at home with him. And the angels here were pointing out, well, since the sons-in-law with those other two daughters didn't want to obey, Lot, you, your wife, and your two daughters all flee. But what do we learn? We see how the scriptures bring up the fact that he lingered. And so in Patriarchs and Prophets on page 160, paragraph 1, it says, But Lot delayed. Though daily distressed at beholding deeds of violence, he had no true conception of the debasing and abominable iniquity practiced in that vile city. He did not realize the terrible necessity for God's judgments to put a check on sin. Some of his children clung to Sodom, and his wife refused to depart without them. The thought of leaving those whom he, had, whom he held dearest on earth seemed more than he could bear. It was hard to forsake his luxurious home and all the wealth acquired by the labors of his whole life to go forth a destitute wanderer. Stupefied with sorrow, he lingered, loath to depart. But the angels of God, sorry, but for the angels of God, they would have all perished in the ruin of Sodom. The heavenly messengers took him and his wife and daughters by the hand and led them out of the city. So yeah, she's saying, but for the but for the angels of God, just essentially saying like, if it wasn't for them. So Lot was sorrowed. He was distressed at the thought of losing all the luxury he had acquired and the loss of his two daughters. Now this teaches us a lesson here too, doesn't it? We find that Lot, though he had faith, his faith was affected having dwelt in Sodom. His thoughts of leaving his luxurious acquirements behind bothered him. But it's not just that. He was also worried about losing his daughters. The thought of losing his daughters saddened him, brought sorrow upon him. Now, this sentiment and this feeling was not only felt by Lot, but it was also a feeling that was shared by his own wife, who did not desire to depart. Thus, Lot was hedged in with difficulties. And so the same sore trials that are upon his heart are upon her heart, and she does not want to go. And so, again, we see here the couple had been, in part, affected by the degrading influences of Sodom. Thus, again, we see how the situation that they were in, the place that they were living in, had sorely affected their faith. Chapter 10, verses 34 to 39 says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I am not, I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Now are not these final words here, finding and losing your life, similar to that which is found in Luke, that those who shall seek to find their lives shall lose it, and those who are willing to lose their lives shall find it? That is, those who are willing to lose 
that which is in this world, notwithstanding how difficult that separation may be, will be blessed in their deed. So when though, although you may leave behind houses and lands, although you, they may be blessings that we may have received from the Lord, we are not to love them more than God. And though we are told to love our father and our mother and our brothers and our sisters, and the husband is to love the wife and the wife, the husband and the parents, the children and the children, the parents, our love for God is to be exceedingly higher than our love is for them. In their mercy dragged Lot out of his place. And so Lot was genuinely being spared. God was blessing him. Chapter 19, verses 17 to 20, it says, And it came to pass that, and it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold now. Thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Well, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. Again, we see evidence that the surroundings that Lot had were genuinely affecting his faith. He feared that some evil was going to overtake him. He did not stop to realize that couldn't God just save him if some evil threatened to come upon him? I mean, God was saving Lot from an imminent destruction. <laughs> From which, when it comes to dealing with God, no man can escape from God. And yet Lot is afraid of some other kind of evil, thinking that other kind of evil is going to overcome him. I have such doubts. Why think that he's going to be destroyed? If we've seen that God has manifested his mercy to us, and he is saving us out of a situation, why not trust him through that process? He's not going to take us out of a situation and then leave you to be destroyed later on. That's not how he works. If we're obeying him and doing that which he has called us to do, why would we think or have in any kind of thought process that we are going to be harmed and destroyed in some way, obeying the commandments of God. But instead of choosing to flee to a mountain, his thought process was, please let me escape to this city. Because if I go to the mountain, you know, some, something may happen if I go to the mountain. Now, Psalm 91, verses 9 to 11 tells us this, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. And so we should have faith and trust that he's going to protect us. If God tells us that we have to flee out of the city for whatever purpose, then trust him. Flee. He'll guide you. He'll protect you. He's not going to allow some evil to overtake you. He's not going to say, flee the city, and then allow you to just starve to death. He's not going to say, flee from the city, and then allow some bear to come and maul you to death. And so... What we can learn from this situation is the fact that we need to have faith and trust him when he gives us a command, obey the command, and obey that which he's brought before us. 
and we shall be blessed. So, now verses 23 to 26 of Genesis 19 says, The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Now, she openly disobeyed the commandment of God. She looked back. Why did she look back? Well, it's, we have to understand that Lot's, the loss of Lot's wife has something to do with Lot's own lack of faith. Look at how these... So many of these things have chain reactions, right? It was because Lot was merciful unto the angels that gave him the message of mercy to be spared. But it was in selecting Sodom in the first place that hampered his own faith. And not only his own faith was hampered, but also the faith and his family members as well. And in not obeying the command to flee out of Sodom and taking so long to flee, his hesitancy was only making his wife more stubborn. If he had felt an earnestness in fleeing, then she could have felt the same earnestness and fled. Page 161, paragraph 2 of Patriarchs and Prophets, it says, If Lot himself had manifested no hesitancy to obey the angel's warning, but had earnestly fled toward the mountains without one word of pleading or remonstrance, his wife also would have made her escape. The influence of his example would have saved her from the sin that sealed her doom. But his hesitancy and delay caused her to lightly regard the divine warning. While her body was upon the plain, her heart clung to Sodom, and she perished with it. She rebelled against God because his judgments involved her possessions and her children in the ruin. Although so greatly favored in being called out from the wicked city, she felt that she was severely dealt with because the wealth that it had taken years to accumulate must be left to destruction. Instead of thankfully accepting deliverance, she presumptuously looked back to desire the life of those who had rejected the divine warning. Her sin showed her to be unworthy of life, for the preservation of which she felt so little gratitude. Thankful at being spared and brought out of that situation. She felt, as Sister White says, she was as if she was severely dealt with. She was unreconciled to the fact that she had to escape. She didn't want to have to leave her children, and she didn't want to have to leave her goods behind. Now understand, it doesn't mean that you can't be upset at the fact that your children have not accepted truth and have not obeyed truth. But the simple fact of the matter is you cannot desire to go back. You should thankfully accept the hand, the mercy of, sal of salvation that is brought to you. And so what caused her to look back? Well, many situations, but the simple fact of the matter is, is that her heart was not pure. She was impure in heart. And while Lot's heart was indeed worked upon by the Holy Spirit, as he had thus manifested courtesy, yet a part of his heart had clung a little bit too much to Sodom, and it led to the loss of his very own wife. 
And so we can see that there are many things that can be learned from looking at the destruction of Sodom. There is a necessity for understanding the urgency of escaping the wicked cities. There is an urgency to understand the necessity of escaping the wicked churches. The people must be taught, come out of her, my people, because soon Babylon is to be destroyed. Soon the very cities that we may dwell in are to be destroyed. And as we flee from these things, we may leave behind things that we may have never thought we would have to leave behind. Old teachers, old friends, maybe even old houses, old roommates. These things must be put behind us as we go forward. So. The heart, though being worked upon by the Holy Spirit, Lot's heart being worked upon, it was apparent here that his wife was not prepared to accept truth or to accept yeah, the divine mercy that was shown her to be escaping away from the destruction of Sodom. We must desire pure hearts, lest we do the same thing that Lot's wife did. Because the simple fact of the matter is, is though you may be running away from Sodom, if you look back with longing, it can lead to your destruction. We learn from Lot's mistake that we must obey the convictions of the Holy Spirit without delay. For doing so can cause ourselves and others great harm and even destruction. Now on page 167, paragraph 3, Sister White says, Lot dwelt but a short time in Zoar. Iniquity prevailed there as in Sodom, and he feared to remain lest the city should be destroyed. Not long after Zoar was consumed, as God had purpose. So eventually, Zoar itself, a wicked city, was destroyed. Lot, even though he ran into that city, did not find safety therein. He saw the same corruption that was in Sodom, and he fled right to the mountains, what he should have done in the first place. He should have fled from, he should have just went to the mountains in the first place. Eventually, Lot's mind just ends up agreeing with the judgments that God is bringing. The destruction of Sodom reminds me of something in found in the book of the prophecy of Zechariah, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. And it says, And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with, a ch with change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by This Joshua, this high priest, was as a brand plucked out of the fire. Now that's interesting, right? Because similarly, it is as Lot was. He was as a brand plucked from the fire. It was moments away from consuming that city. 
but his act of mercy spared him. His act of benevolence spared him. This is a lesson to be learned. Why it is necessary to always have Christ-likeness. Manifest a tender, Christ-like, pitying courtesy. Manifest that Christ-like love. How do we get that? Of course, through studying of the scriptures and by going to God in prayer. And then we live our lives as we should, following his commandments. And Christ will be with us. And the lessons that have been taught us in the word, we put to practice. Now, we ourselves may feel as a brand plucked from the burning. I know that I have felt this way myself in regards to that which we are formerly part of. I also know that something is heading, if not already has headed their way. What it is, I cannot tell. Nevertheless, we must press onwards and forwards. With that said, are there any questions or comments in regards to study today? Oh, I see a little happening. All righty. If not, if you guys have prayer requests, final prayer requests you want to put in, you can put them into the room. All righty. If you can, please kneel, and we will close with prayer. Please by hearts. Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us with your word and with Sister White's writings. We pray that the lessons learned and the truths that were spoken are as seeds planted and watered in our hearts, and we pray that you please give increase unto them. Please help us as a church body to continue to move forward to that which is required of us in Christ Jesus. Please bless the work that is done, and please bless our hearts that we become more and more Christ-like, and please bless the souls whom we share the truth with, that the Holy Spirit will convict their hearts so that they can accept the truth for what it is. Father, please bless the remainder of this Holy Sabbath day. Please bless the new week up ahead of all of your children. And thank you for blessing us and loving us as you always do. And it is with the help of your Holy Spirit that we pray for these things. And in Jesus' mighty and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen.